Quigley and welcome to episode 208 of the Weekly Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. If you are watching this on YouTube, I apologise for the hood being up. It is uh, early morning. They say the weather's, it's Saturday morning. They say uh, the weather's going to get a bit warmer today and I hope it does because I'm freezing my arse off in the gym, when I'm on the bike, even when I'm at home. So yeah, a little bit of warmth, but it's like I said, it's early. I, I have put the heater on. I hope to take this hood down at some point because I'm not Eminem. Do you know what I mean? Although I do have a good lyrical flow. So there you go. But um, first of all, thanks very much uh, to Connor Nolan for joining us last week. We got some lovely messages and Connor uh, did also. Uh, Connor's a really good speaker. In fairness, uh, he does do that um, as part of his uh I suppose adv- advocacy um for mental health and what he's been through um and we we obviously talked about that and we talked about his uh, bodybuilding and, and stuff like that and uh, it was a pleasure to have uh, Connor on so thank you very much Connor you can sub- I have to be very I'm going to try and do this correctly because I've been questioned about this before you can support us and buy me a coffee if you like it would be very helpful and um we are working uh, behind the scenes on trying to improve things as always um I just seem to be collecting instruments at the moment, so I don't know what that's all about. But um, that might come into play in this episode. But it's uh, it's um, it's very nice uh, for the people who have done it. And uh, if you'd like to support us, the link is in the description. Okay. Um, there will be uh, more guests, obviously. Well, we had two guests in our own, I suppose, already. Uh, and there's more on the way. Uh, it is quite difficult to get people in January because I suppose everybody's trying, like, I know the episode I did a couple of weeks ago about resolutions and all that, like, but people are trying new things and, and they are particularly busy in January and things kind of seem to level out a little bit in February. So it'll be easier to get guests. But if I've got some irons in the fire. Don't worry. Um, I wouldn't let you down. Um, And I think I've had a kind of a change of heart about solo episodes a little bit mainly due to a few people who, you know, uh, said that they really liked the 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 solo ones. Um, and I guess it's, it's a confidence thing for me that, you know, I, uh, like everybody else, I need to hear it. Uh, I need some reassurance that they're okay. And I think people um, have given me some reassurance about that. And, you know, maybe I should lean into them a little bit more. But it's, it's also about the idea of me... Um, not just confidence. It's not. It's not about confidence speaking on the mic on my own because I'm okay with that. But it's just about the confidence of coming up with interesting topics that people might be into, um, uh, and not repeating myself uh, over and over again. Because at this stage, with the amount of episodes we have, I need to go back and when I have an idea, I need to go back and check. Especially the the ones that I did during the lockdown. There was like whatever it was, sixteen episodes I did, did on my own. I don't want to go over old ground, so I need to make sure that I don't. So. I'm getting there with that, but yeah, there's more guests coming. Don't worry. Um, I uh, I did uh, for people who follow me on Instagram and and on Facebook and things like that. Um, I did my theory test, which I passed. Wouldn't say with flying colors, but I passed it. It doesn't really matter unless you pass it. That was that was my motto in school. It doesn't really matter. You just have to pass it. But I I um I thought it was particularly interesting because leading up to it, so I I did it on Wednesday, but leading up to it. Right up until Monday evening, I was failing all the kind of mock ones I was doing on the app. You, you get an app for for it now, uh, for people who don't know. Um, and I was doing these mock uh, tests. Now, you can do different things on it. You can do like um, a little test in a certain category, like road safety or um, the mechanical problems. I don't even remember the terms. Of um, after a good start. But so we, so we had that like, I had that kind of thing of... Uh, uh, I was I was immediately saying to people, I'm not going to pass this. No, I'm going to pass it. But from Monday evening on, the Monday through Tuesday, I started to pass. But so you need to get 35 out of 40. And I started to get 36, 36. And I was really consistent with the 36. And I, I should have really known what ones I was getting wrong. I had an idea there was one. It was a sneaky one that it kept popping up. And it was phrased in a different way. And I think I just was getting annoyed by it at that stage. And I was just going for broke and and like because it's multiple choice I was just hitting on on something uh a b c d whatever um and uh so I, I started I had a little bit of confidence going in but I had kind of written it off I said to my mom and I said to a couple of people I was kind of written it off as like already thinking I'll do it I could do it again anyway so it's not the end of the world you know um so I went in on the Wednesday um and it's a typical kind of 
office government place with chairs and numbered and you sit down you wait your turn whatever so okay now to be fair i was in and out very fast which that, that was a real positive on them they were very quick but so i sit in my chair and so i thought the interest there's a couple of interesting parts but i went up to the desk and uh, the lady was very nice and you know you sign your name and all that stuff and you give your idea and, and then she said right you have to turn your phone off put it in the locker here and i was like right it's understandable and um, you don't want people cheating uh, so I put it in the locker and my jacket, home my jacket up and all that. And she was like, anything in the pockets? And I said, no, just a tissue. And she says, you have to put that in the thing. And she, I said, the tissue? And like, and not an aggressive way, obviously. I wouldn't do that. But I, I was kind of shocked. But I suppose people would write, could write notes on a tissue um, um, and then blow their nose and ruin the notes. But I, I, also you had to roll up your sleeves. But then when I went into um, the next room, which is just before, so th they, they, they use the wand, like they scan you, you know, arms out wide, scan you, roll out your pockets. I had a hood on. They were like, you know, uh, just ruffle out the hood so there's nothing in the hood. And it was really like I was waiting for like to take my socks off and everything, like, you know, like in an airport. And I went into a little off, like office cube because I was worried it was going to be a really test setting when we we're all sitting beside each other. And But obviously you can't because then there'll be the copying situation. So um, we're in little cubicles. You have 45 minutes to answer 40 questions and I did it in 12 minutes and I thought to myself, you can go back and look over the answers of the ones you've done already. Now, I did do that for a couple, but then I thought, I'm not going to answer that any differently. I don't know anything now that I knew that I didn't know 10 minutes ago. Uh, and again, you click through to the end, you do a little survey, you know, for the, how good the people are in there and all that. I give them excellent because they were very good. And uh, yeah, they didn't tell you then on the screen that you passed. Uh, so I was delighted, thrilled myself, you know, and I left and um, they sent you an email then. So I got 37 out of 40. Uh, they don't tell you the ones you got wrong, but they tell you what category category they were in. And I got like two in the category that I was always doing bad in and then one wrong in, in, in something else. But, uh, you know, and and so the next step then, and I was talking again uh, to my mom and that about uh, lessons, leave it a month till... It's not frosty and icy around the place and, and start the, the testing or lesson, sorry. And uh, yeah, so that was that. Uh, got it out of the way. Um, I went to another gig. Outrageous. Um, the amount of gigs and getting to these days. I went up to see, and I had to explain this to a lot of people because I didn't quite get it. Okay, so it was called The Last Waltz Live. If people are aware, in 1974, the band, yes, that's what they're called, um, they did a, a very famous final concert filmed by Martin Scorsese um, with guests like Neil Young, Johnny Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, amongst others. Um, and it was like a really long show and stuff. So the band, a really brilliant band, to be fair. Um, you know, people know to Take a Load Off Annie, Take a Load For Free. They know that song, but they've got so many better songs than that. Um, and it was really good. It was in the Olympia. Um, it was... Uh, they, they were so like the band are such a tight band I was thinking like this is going to be a hard this is a hard group to be a cover band of but the, the players were, were great they had a horn section there the person who did Van Morrison there was local musicians that came out local singers and musicians came out to, to do those songs and the guy who did Van Morrison was brilliant like his voice was so good Um, yeah so it was really good like you know obviously there's always some anxiety when it comes to gigs with me and I hadn't been in the Olympia since I think it was Richard Ashcroft. It was either Richard Ashcroft or Shane McGowan. It was one of those that I last uh, saw in the Olympia about 21, 22 years ago. And it hasn't changed. And that's a good thing because I think it's a great venue, uh, a lot of history. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really I'm really gra glad I went. The next one now is in March um, for The Smile uh, in the Three Arena. I'm looking forward to that. So I was asked by my friend Claire during the week, um, What's your favourite lyric? And I, some of you listeners will know that I'm very good at knowing what my favourite things are because I like an old list. And I was kind of stumped. And I, I, and it made me think like, well, there's probably a few different ones for different situations, but what's my very favourite? And I still haven't come up with an answer to that. Um, so I wanted to kind of dig into some of the ones I really like and why, you know, in different situations, lyrics might be different. And there's the idea of like, there's a great lyric. There's a great delivery of a lyric, which is important too, you know, with some passion. And, you know, speaking of the band, when when Van Morrison sings Caravan with the band, it's better than his 
his solo caravan because I don't know he sings it with more passion. No, he was coked up to the eyeballs. That that is that is a very famous story about that concert. That there was a, a literal cocaine room where people went and just and in the video in the in the footage you see Neil Young. He's still got the white residue around his nostril. Um. So yeah, and there's the delivery of it, and then there's knowing the story behind the lyric, which is something that I've kind of gone into before, but with with a couple of songs. Uh, that I've that I've mentioned when I've talked about music and stuff. So I, I really went into a deep dive in this and look to be like there'll be a couple of things I'll go over, but then there's a couple of uh, sorry, there'll be a couple of things that I went over before, but then there's reasons behind it for kind of dipping into it again because you don't want to leave those ones out. So like my my initial answer to Claire was uh, like a, a lyric that stands out to me, and this isn't, you know, very deep or anything, but it stands out to me for a reason of knowing the backstory. Uh, of the lyric and that's like I said a minute ago that's one of the ways I like lyrics so I read the news today oh boy is the opening line from uh, my favourite song of all time A Day on the Life by the Beatles and without the context it's just like a setup for what's to come in the song Um, with the context it's literally John Lennon reading the news in a newspaper because it starts about someone dying in a traffic accident. Who, uh, ta um, Tara, he was a Guinness Air, uh, Tara Brown, uh, and that was that's the opening kind of verse about him dying in the uh, in the traffic accident. And then it goes about you know there's four thousand holes in Blackburn, Lancashire, um, enough to for holes to fill the Albert Hall, which is something that was actually in the paper, which is a weird kind of way to measure holes, isn't it? Like potholes, but measuring it by you know, I think there's enough holes around here to fill the three arena or no, no, I would say the Olympia. It's a bit too, you know, that kind of, it's a very strange measurement. Um, But I do think like that, that's such a, a, um, a beautiful opening line, a, a kind of a, it's, it's not really vague when you know what he's talking about. But if you don't know that he, that, that John Lennon picked up the newspaper that morning and wrote a song, about the stories that were in the newspaper, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. Like, it's not really that deep, anything like that. Um, but the fact that he says, I read the news today, oh boy, as if the news is not going to be good. And is it ever good? Not really. Like, it's depressing. You know, something we, I've talked about before, the kind of the idea of me not really tapping into the news that often anymore because it is depressing and it's 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 a hard watch and I understand the 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 ignorance or people will say I'm being ignorant to, to what's going on in the world. Look, I still know what's going on in the world. I just need to don't need to be reminded about it every single day about the the kind of tough things that are going on. So I think that's what's really clever about that line is he says oh boy in a way meaning like the the first verse is, is a very tough you know, verse about someone dying, but then it gets kind of, you know, this kind of inane news about, you know, the, the amount of holes in Blackburn. You know, it's, 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 a, you could, some people would have flipped it the other way and gone with the kind of light news first and then the heavy news after. So I think that I like that. Although in saying that, I, actually, I'm taking the hood off. Um, in saying that, like, it is kind of like a, a news story that happens at the end of a, a news bulletin, isn't it? There's always some kind of fun and cutesy story at the end. So maybe that's why. He's going for it with that. But yeah, that's the one that stands up because of, again, the story behind the lyric. Um, there's another one, and I've mentioned this song a number of times, and the reason I mention it is because it's one of my favourite songs of all time. But I don't know if I've really delved deep into the actual context context of the lyrics. Um, and and I've I've talked about how, how great the song is, obviously. Um but the actual lyrics themselves, I, I really like because they kind of go off on one. So um, it's about, it seems to be about the, the drudgery of, of modern life as David Byrne knew it uh, and how it can pass you by. And there's some things that, you know, I can't relate to, uh, such as, and you may find yourself living in a shotgun shack and you may find yourself in another part of the world. And you may find yourself behind the wheel of a large automobile and you may find yourself in a beautiful house with a beautiful wife and you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? So I can't relate to any of that. I don't have that beautiful wife. Uh, I don't live in a shotgun shack. 
Uh, I and I don't not yet driving behind the wheel of a large automobile soon though, but um, and, and you know that's all that is all kind of it, he does go into all this stuff about the drudgery of modern life and and the stuff is like, you know, in the chorus he talks about letting the days go by, let the water hold me down, letting the days go by, water flowing underground into the blue again after the money's gone, once in a lifetime, water flowing underground, all this stuff about, um. He constantly is saying, and you may ask yourself as if the, the the how as human beings are constantly questioning things, but maybe not con constantly questioning where we are and who we are. We're questioning other things, you know, about, you know, about science or climate change and 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 uh, you know, why is everything so expensive? And but not about the actual things within our real lives. Uh, again, he asks about like. Um, and you may ask yourself, how do I work this? You may ask yourself, where is that large automobile? Uh, you may tell yourself, this is not my beautiful wife. You may tell yourself, this is not my beautiful wife. I, I love the way he delivers that. You've got to listen to the song. Um, and the chorus is saying, but the bridge um, may be my favorite uh, bit because eight times he repeats the line, same as it ever was. And the idea of, is that a good th good thing or a bad thing? For me, it's probably a good thing because then anxiety is not as as prevalent. But for others, it's like same as it ever was. It's the boring, mundane. I need to get out of this. I need to do something different. And he talks about um, he talks about water in the song a lot, actually, for some reason. But um, again, I, I'm not an expert on on breaking apart David Byrne's lyrics. Um, but it's talk. Yeah, they talk about water holding him down, flowing underground into the silent water under the rocks and stones. There is water underground. Um. So whatever that part means, I don't know. And then the very last line, into the blue again, after the money's gone, once in a lifetime, water flowing underground. So I like that because he seems to be very animated when he's singing the song, live or in the um or on the album. But is it the like mundanity of life that he's talking about in the first verses in, you know, this is where I am? Uh the second verse is like, why am I here? Or he's almost shocked to be in this situation. Like, this is not my beautiful wife is is a kind of a telling line. I suppose that's been picked apart by people before, but um, there's something great about it. And I love the passion in which he sings it. It makes you believe that this is something he's having kind of an existential crisis or a midlife crisis. And he is, star is that the same thing? Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. But he is starting to... Uh, look at his life in a way that um, maybe he's not as happy or as content as he might be and he's got other places to be and other places to go. I, I love it. I, I think it's great and I think it does go along with the way he delivers it. Um, a, a, another one that's like a story behind the song, um, like, a, like I talked about A Day in the Life, is Idiot Wind by Bob Dylan because it's particularly brutal, a, a lot of the lyrics in it. And and one line in particular, which, which I picked out, and you could pick out a number of lines at the brutality of the actual uh, lyrics. And it's um, idiot wind blowing every time you move your mouth. So he was going through a, a breakup and a divorce during the making of Blood on the Tracks. Um, it's not very, you don't have to be very smart um, to break that apart in the, in the actual album. It's like Marvin Gaye's album, Hear My Dear, you know he's going through something and he obviously he was going through a divorce as well. But like the Bob Dylan is so brutal in, in this song. It's 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 pretty horrible because I think well it seems horrible, like I know it's an artistic license situation, but his 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 wife at the time, Sarah, was like not exactly able to I know it's not about biting back, but she wasn't able to answer you know, the idea of him, she called, he calls her an idiot so many times, blowing every time you move your mouth, blowing every time, to, to, I can't remember the full lyrics of the song, but it's, it's so vicious. Like, and look, if you're listening to that song without knowing that it's about that, you might, you might say, oh, that's about a friend or that's just about a fictitious character or that's like about maybe a, a you know, like a um, a character he read in a book and he didn't like, so he said, this is, I'm going to write this, but this is about his, his wife or soon-to-be ex-wife, and it's brutal. Um, and it's not, a, and and I think for that, it's not an easy listen, and I, I really like the actual song and, and uh, the, the core progressions and everything about it, and I really like that Blood on the Tracks album, but I think that um, uh, sometimes... Um, who am I to say what Bob Dylan could do and not do? But I, I wonder, could he have, <laughs> could he have maybe 
being a bit more subtle with his delivery um uh in that song but that that line in particular blow idiot wind blowing every time you move your mouth is 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 a it's a standout line but but not in a in a, a joyous way that i think that's oh, i love that but but i i do that's the thing i really like the song and the melody and and everything about it except for dylan's voice that much i don't know if dylan's voice is okay in it but yeah, that's one that stands out. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's one of those lyrics that always surprises me because of how brutal it is, and also because there's a backstory to it. Um, uh, Easy E's versus Straight Outta Compton. Um, you know, I think uh, as far as rap music goes, the the use of lyrical flow, um, uh, obviously that's in, been important. You know, since lyrics were in. Uh, music and popular music, but the use of lyrics and lyrical flow and how they use, um, I suppose how rappers can use, uh, they can tap into this kind of celebrity culture or drop in references about other musicians or drop in references about novels or films and 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 you know, in such a great way. And they have more use of the of the lyric because they have more space in which to kind of explore the idea of um of I guess poetry really. And I think Easy E's verse, and I'm gonna recite this. So it's um it's a brother that would smother your mother, make your sister think make your sister think I love her, dangerous mother bleep in raising hell. Whenever I get caught, I'm like bail. I'm sorry if I got a couple of words wrong there, but Easy E's like if you don't know um, NWA uh, group uh, from the late eighties, early nineties, Ice, Ice, um, Ice Cube, and and Dr. Dre and Easy, um, and and MC Ren and what's the NFL DJ Yenna or whatever his name, is. um, so Straight Outta Compton was a particular was probably the breakout song, and it, it, they all take a, a turn on the verse. But I don't know, Easy E's is just uh, seems more. I don't know. I prefer it than than the the verses by Dre or Cube and and um Jeremy Dre or Cube. But uh, I just think his his delivery is excellent. He died um very young, uh, unfortunately due to complications with uh, HIV, um. But he uh he left a serious mark, and uh, people seem to love the guy. Um, but it, that that line. That sorry, that verse or the start of his his opening, the start of his uh, section is so good, and um, it's got some it's got some curses in it. Fair enough, but uh, that's all right. It's all expression, isn't it? But I, I've always stood out for me, and maybe because you know my friend Paul used to uh, when we were younger, he'd play rap all the time, and 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 I heard that so often that it became a something that I jump in on for the for that song in particular and I was able to recite that bit. Not all is 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 part, but in particularly that, but um it's a brother that it's a brother that would smother your mother is like <laughs> Jesus. But it's it's great. Like I love it. Um but but you know the all this this is only part of the, the, the section. So what I wanted to do was this, okay? So um, this is, by the way, this is not my attempt at rapping. Um, I'll just be just before. So I got myself a little lyric notebook. I haven't written lyrics in a, in a long time, maybe two or three years. Um, excuse me for a second, actually, because I you know I'm going to I'm going to blow up my nose. And you know, eating and blowing your nose on mic is not allowed on this podcast. So hold on. Sorry, I should have said talk amongst yourselves. So I was I was a. Uh, I was sitting in uh, at home the other day and I was messing around with a little chord kind of progression. I even threw in a little Joni Mitchell chord in there. Um, you'll, I'll play it someday and you, you'll hear it. Uh, so this is what I wrote. I don't think this is particularly good, but there's, I'm going to explain to you afterwards what, I, what it means. So the, the verse is, so how was your day? Well, 50 floated on the ground to me. And what did you say? I thank the person who could live for free. I don't like it, but it's got, I could, it's got room to play around with. The 50 floated on the ground to me. One day I was standing out in uh, Scribes in, in at the Athlone College and my girlfriend at the time was in Scribes. I couldn't get in because you needed a student to be there with you to, to bring you in. So and I there must have been mobile phones. I must have had a mobile phone. But um, uh, I, I was trying to get in contact with her and I was literally standing outside my own. There's people queuing up kind of off to the right that, that they couldn't, they wouldn't be able to see where I was standing. And literally a 50 euro just floated, 
exploded at my and landed at my feet. And I picked it up and I thought, well, that's weird. I put it in my wallet. There's no one around. I'm not going to go. Imagine going up to the, the, the queue. Did anyone lose 50 euro? 50 hands go up. I'm not happy about this. I'm not pleased about it. I was at the time, but but there was no one there. I, and this is not an exaggeration. 45 seconds later, another 50. Floats by up onto my foot. I pick it up, put it in my pocket. 100 euro. 100 euro now is, is, is solid. 100 euro then was very solid. You know, 21, 22 years ago. And then I'm like, I get, trying to get my girlfriend to come out, you know, whatever way I was doing it to get her out, like smoke signals. I don't know what I was using. Um, yes, I'm that old. Um, so she comes out and I'm like, could you just go walk, get a taxi? And I think she had a friend with her. I was like, let's just walk, get a taxi. Just, and I showed her in the taxi at 100 euro. And we were like, we drank like kings and queens that night. Um, so I ha that popped in my head the other day. I remembered that moment. So that's why I put it, well, 50 floated on the ground to me. I thank the person who could live for free. I don't really like that part. I could change that part. I like the idea of putting in something that actually happened. So I, I, I wrote that lyric. I wrote it like a pre-chorus. The lyrics are just, uh, it's not lost, it's not lost yet, which is, it makes more sense to play with, with chords. Um, and then, But then I wrote a second verse. And this, to me, is much better than the first verse. So do I need to get into the rhythm again of that writing lyrics and stuff like that? So the second verse is, so I went away, a trip to mute the buzz and hum and wails, not black, but more gray, left out in the sun, these things just start to pale. Now that is way better than the first verse. It, but it doesn't have, it doesn't mean, it doesn't have a, a specific memory tied to it. It doesn't have, um, it doesn't really have a specific meaning. I mean, you could say like, you know, a trip to mute, like, so I went away, a trip to mute the buzz and hum and wails. It's something that we, we, um, um, we do like to get, you know, getting away from the, the regular, sorry, I'm shaking the camera and um, to get away from the regular stuff that's in our heads all the time. We need breaks and stuff. And I, I understand that that might mean something. Then I kind of tied in the idea of, uh, not black, but more gray, left out, in the, left out in the sun. These things just start to pale because obviously things in the sun, uh, I'm not talking about our skin, by the way, but uh, things fade and pale in the sun. So I was like, oh, that's really good. So the first verse isn't grey, but it has a memory tied to it. So I, I kind of like it for that reason, but I can mess around with it. And the second verse is really good. And did I just take more time with that? Because when I was writing the first verse, I was playing the chords along. When I was writing the second verse, I literally had the, the I didn't have the guitar on my lap. Uh, I just had the, the copy and I was like, I'll write the second verse without, because I already had the melody from the first verse, you know what I mean? So it's, just, it's such an interesting thing, this songwriting. And and, and look, I want to try and get back into it just from my own head. like. Um, and I know I'm going to do the synth stuff and that, but just when I'm picking up the guitar, which is obviously more natural to me, it, it's it's interesting to see how lyrics can progress and you can get better. And, and that's just practice and stuff. But that was two days between them. Um, and I always found myself to be, when I was writing songs more, I, I used to think that I was, lyrics weren't a problem. It was the music. And I'm starting to think that it's the other way around now. Um, but I'm still, I sent out my piano, by the way, for a pair. So that's going to come back soon. So then I can start writing songs and that, which is another challenge in itself, because I think you're writing a different way. I'm, I'm more comfortable on a guitar. So I think you're writing a much different way um, with, with piano. So I know Tom York did that between, um, OK Computer and Kid A where he, he was having so much problems with writing block that he just started writing on a piano which he wasn't really able to play at the time and, and it allowed him to to enter into a different phase altogether and then we see the results in, in something like Kid A. So let's get back into a few more. I don't want to run too long. I don't hear him. I don't want you to hear my voice for way too long. So um, the next one I picked... Uh, Nick Cave, if people don't know Nick Cave, an Australian singer with the Bad Seeds, and he's been around a, a long time at this stage, and, and he's, as a lyricist, he is absolutely brilliant, um, very dark at times, very deep at times, which which I like. I picked um, a song called Jubilee Street. I, I love the song. It's great. Um, it's about about 10 years old now, I think. Um, but I picked the last stanza. Uh, so... The the line on the last stanza is um or the lines. So I'm alone now, I'm beyond recriminations. Curtains are shut, the furniture is gone, I'm transforming, I'm vibrating, I'm glowing, I'm flying. Look at me now. A lot to pick apart there. I'm not gonna pick it all apart, but 
there's something amazingly transformative about it the lines in it them in themselves rather than you know the effect the, the actual fact he says transforming anyway but he talks about being alone and then beyond recrimination so like curtains are shut furniture is gone so just picturing yourself just in a bare room on your own and then he says look at me now so i don't know what this song is about but I like the idea. I think it's really great when you hear it along with the music and the the way the music builds up. That's such a great song. But I love what I love about it is the idea of he's he's gone to the back to the very he stripped everything bare. He's gone all the way back to um, the beginning, almost like an empty room, just standing there on your own. And now he wants you to look at him. Where it's like the idea of that would be we'd all be nearly ashamed. Like, what? Did, how did we get here? Did we lose everything? You know, are we... Oh, going back to how did we get here? That was like once in a lifetime line. I'm going... I'm doing this. This isn't even on purpose. This is just... This is what happens when you start riffing. But, um, yeah, I like the idea of just being stripper and, like, I'm flying, look at me now, and, you know, the longing for maybe someone's attention all of a sudden that, like, when we do go on our own and we do strip everything back bare, it's maybe not quite what we thought we wanted um, and I can think I think I can relate to that because I think it, I was at a time in my life where I did I wanted to be on my own and, and not to be bothered and the only people who could really talk to me were my parents my, my grandparents and, and my brothers like that you know like a family thing I didn't need other people around but then there's an unhappiness in that too like but I wasn't you know and like I'm transforming I'm embracing look at me now that was, just, you know, maybe not that dramatically, but that happened to me. Um, I did transform. I, d I don't think I very braided, but um, and I didn't fly. But, you know, what is flying really? You know, is it a physical act or is it a, a development of ourselves? Is it a mental act? So, yeah, maybe that speaks to me in a certain way, but I love it. Um. Uh, another thing that I, I wanted to put in that I, I'll need to look this up as well because I want to get it right. Um, speaking of, uh, you know, the band and, and the last waltz that I went to see, um, uh, J the Joni Mitchell song that she performs in in that uh, in that concert is called uh, Coyote. If you don't know the song, um, again, like all these songs, go go and check it out because it's 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 so good. Um, so I'm going to read the whole lot of this and I'll explain why afterwards. So Coyote's in the coffee shop. He's staring a hole in, in his scrambled eggs. I love that. He picks up my scent in his fingers while he's watching the waitress's legs. He's too fat from the Bay of Fundy from Appaloosas and Eagles and Tides and the air-conditioned cubicles and the carbon ribbon rides are spelling it out so clear. Either he's going to have to stand and fight or take it out of here. I try to run away myself, to run away and wrestle with my ego. And with this flame you put here in this Eskimo, in this hitcher, in this prisoner, on the fine white lines of the white of the white lines on the free freeway. Now, this is about her breakup with David Crosby um, of Crosby, Nash and Young. Um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Sorry. Sorry, Stills, Mr. Stephen Stills. Um, uh, observational lyrics, but in the idea of a separation where he's the coyote, he's the one sitting in the coffee shop checking out other women uh, and she's the one trying to, uh, you know, go free. Uh, earlier in the song, she talks about he's on the ranch while she's out, like, on tour um, and they're separate people and it's not working out and all this. And I, I like, listen to any uh, Johnny Mitchell lyrics. Like, Johnny Mitchell's the best writer, songwriter of her generation. Bob Dylan says it. All the all the people that we hold up, usually men, you know, like Bob Dylan, Neil Young, um, even people in Stills Nash and uh, Crosby Stills Nash, all those people who we we regard as these great great songwriters, just go and read any of Joni Mitchell's lyrics. Um, I could have picked, I I was going to pick um, uh, 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 it's so early. Um, I was going to pick uh, both sides now. Um. I was going to pick Blue. I was going to pick a number of her songs. River is another song with the lyrics in her. Beautiful. But she's one of the great lyricists of all time. One of the great singers of all time. Uh, incredible guitar player. Like I was saying, I, I put a Joni Mitchell chord into my song just to be cute. 
but you know, um, well, it's not a Johnny Mitchell chord. I think it sounds like a Johnny Mitchell chord, something open and and very loose. But uh, that that observational kind of lyrics is not easily done. Um, and you know, when we're talking about those kind of observational lyrics, I don't know much about like modern music. Um, uh, you know, which may be a surprise to to no one, but. When I look, think back about Beatles songs, there's not many observational Beatles songs. There's some, but there's not many observational, like A Day in the Life is one. But there's, Neil Young was very good at it and Bob Dylan was very good at it and like Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam is very good at the observational lyrics and he's obviously greatly inspired by people like Neil Young and Bob Dylan. But observational lyrics, I think, are very, very tricky and um, it's better to write from kind of the, you know, the perspective of how you felt and how you dream and all of those kind of things, how you think. But when you're, when you're looking at someone else and try to picture a, a story rather than a, a, um, a thought or an idea, I think it's really hard. And Jody Mitchell's like, so good at it. Um, I've talked about Frances Farmer will have a revenge on Seattle. I've talked about Nirvana as a, as a, as a band of, of Kurt Cobain being a, a, an extremely underrated guitar, um, not, well, guitarist as well as a uh, lyricist, but, Francis Farmer, where he read the book about the actress, um, Francis Farmer, who had been put into a, a psych ward, which this, which is true. Um, there's debate of whether she had the electric uh, convulsive therapy. Um, she said she did. Uh, the the hospital said she didn't. Who are we to know at this stage? But Kurt Cobain went with it and decided that you know Francis Farmer had, and that she would have her revenge in Seattle. But there's a line in it that has always stood out to me, um, and, and it's I uh, I miss the comfort in being sad, which is, I suppose, the idea of someone getting the ECT therapy. You know, well, ECT that is therapy. That's a that's ECT. That's me saying therapy twice, basically. But someone having the ECT and uh, losing the ability to be, to be sad, you know, because it's been wiped from the from the mind. And I just think that's a great great line. And 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 Kirk Cobain had his own difficulties with with mental health and. He he would sing it, I suppose, sing it often through the idea of someone else, through someone else's eyes. But I just love that. Like, I miss the comfort of being sad. It's such a good line. um, And it seems so simple, but it's not like, because you're not going to sit down and just, it's not, it wouldn't come to me, put it that way. I can only speak for myself, but it wouldn't come to me. Maybe it would come to you, uh, listener. But there's there's a lot in that. She'd come back as fire, burn all the liars and leave a blanket of ash on the ground. I mean, that's pretty good. But I've talked about it before. I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, so another one I picked up, uh, I picked apart recently. Um, it's a, again, I, I, I realize, uh, I'm sure you've, most of you, if you listen to this a lot, this podcast a lot, realize that I dwell in the sad songs a little bit too much. But there's a song by the, the Smiths um, called I Know It's Over. There's a few little bits I want to talk about. The first line, Oh, mother... I can feel the soil falling over my head. Um, so he's dead, like, or he's he feels like he's dying, which is, you know, heavy. I was, I would suppose. Um, it's a very sad song. Um, uh, so I need to go to this part. Okay, so this is the last part. So it says, "Oh, mother, I can feel the soil falling over my head." Oh no, sorry, this isn't that bit. Here it is. So uh, it's uh, and it never it's over and it never really began. But in my heart, it was so real. And this is someone. This is in quotes, by the way. And you even spoke to me and said, in quotes, "If you're so funny, then why are you on your own tonight? And if you're so clever, then why are you on your own tonight? And if you're so very entertaining, then why are you on your own tonight? If you're so very good looking, why do you sleep alone tonight? I know, because tonight is just like every other night. That's like." Now Morrissey is not a, you know, he's not a, a joyful songwriter. You you could never say that, um, but I think again this is one that's you know uh, in a delivery, um, and I think it, it it does bring it down a bit when the when you hear him actually singing the song because it is sad and it's you know it's a heavy song, but the idea of like someone cutting you down, you saying. It could be both. It could be both ways. It could be you saying you're gorgeous and you're funny and all that, and then somebody saying bringing you down to size, or you could be saying that someone else, 
like you're you're annoyed at someone else and you're you want to have a go at them so you're like well if you're so funny like why are you always on your own or how come you don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend you know um maybe that sticks with me for some reason maybe write in your answers what side am i on do i think i'm so gorgeous and funny or do i not think you're so gorgeous and funny ah who knows who knows it's it's a it's a conundrum but i love it i love the lyrics i think it's great um I had to put in a Tom Waits uh, song because he's one of the great lyricists. And, and I've, I've decided on Marta. The whole song is gorgeous. It's about people reconnecting. So there's one line because it's been 40 years or more now, Marta. Please recall, meet me out for coffee where we'll talk about it all. You know, this um, a reconnection with someone you loved back in the day. And those are the days of roses, poetry and prose. And Marta, all I had was you and all you had was me. There was no tomorrows. We'd packed away our sorrows and we saved them for a rainy day. Um, there's another bit here that I really like. Yeah, that's the course again, sorry. And I was always so impulsive. I guess that I still am. And all that really mattered then was that I was a man. I guess that our being together was never meant to be. And Marta, Marta, I love you. Can't you see? Um, And then the, 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 there's no tomorrows. We packed away our sorrows and we'd saved them for a rainy day. And remember quiet evenings trembling close to you. Again, I'm not doing it justice. You'd be surprised to learn. But I think you should listen to that song as as a as a story thing again, as a, as that, you know, the Johnny Mitchell idea of, of a, a narrative to a song. It starts at one point of him trying to reconnect with someone and then maybe being, and again, like, you know, only Tom Waits could answer, but... um then maybe being the plan, the story that you had in mind didn't quite come to fruition and things fall apart a little bit. And, uh, you know, we've probably all been there, have we? Um, just me? <laughs> Let's just have a quick drink. But yeah, excuse me. Um, another one, Like, sorry to be kind of flying through the nail, but another one I had to put in, and this is uh, this is a song by... The legendary Nina Simone, uh, written with uh, Langston Hughes, a poet, a very famous poet at the time, a black poet. Um, verse one of, I wrote down verse one, uh, is the bit to go. So, so it's Mr. Black, oh, Mr. Backlash, Mr. Backlash, just who do you think I am? You raise my taxes, freeze my wages and send my son to Vietnam. You give me second class houses and second class schools. Do you think that all coloured folks are just second class fools? That's that. I mean, I can't speak to the the experiences of of Langston Hughes and Nina Simone, but um, they can certainly put their experiences across to me in a way that I can um, be stunned by the directness of the lyrics. Because are you to remember, like this is at a time when these lyrics weren't, you know. Um, let's say they weren't put out, they were only around in, in certain circles, you know, in, in the idea of it being stories told and songs played in 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 bars and, and not quite arenas, but, you know, um, like the Dean Crow Hall, I suppose. But, but, you know, that idea of smaller kind of venues, but Nina Simone was up there and her delivery every time of Backlash Blues has the anger and kind of vitriol towards the people and the government and, and, and the racist people in the country, in America. Um, she says it all with the way she delivers it. Like, But then obviously herself and Langston Hughes had worked on these lyrics um, to be as 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 damning and, and, and you know, um, uh, you know, important and impactful as possible. And it's, the, yeah, go listen, go listen. I hope you go listen to all of these and kind of make up your own minds. But Backlash Blues... Uh, even the way she plays piano in this, it's like bang, you know. Um, oh, of course, uh, I, I, I nearly forgot. Um, one of the the really great lost uh, uh, people in music is is Jeff Buckley. Um, he died. I think he was thirty three when he died. He was working on his second album. His first album is considered to be a a, a masterpiece. Um. But his lyrics in, in the song Lover, You Should Have Come Over. Um I had a friend whose mother passed away, and at the just just shortly after he said that he couldn't stop thinking about thinking about the first verse of this song 
around the time of his mother's passing. And the, the verse is, um, looking out the door, I see the rain fall upon the funeral mourners, parading in a wake of sad relations as their shoes fill up with water. Um, that You know, that's, you know, obviously he related to, to, to the experiences he had with, you know, his mother's funeral and stuff. Um, but there's such a, there's a, there's such a, an amazing way of setting a scene in, in that verse. And again, like all, you know, lyricists write differently. There's very few who could write a verse to plant you in a situation like that. And maybe you can relate to it, but maybe you can't relate to it as an experience, but you can relate to it as an idea of, you know, seeing or hearing, you know, even seeing if funerals on TV or, or on film, um, or hearing about it and someone saying it always rains at funerals and 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 this idea of the 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 fact that you know they're burying someone but but the kind of throwaway line at the end as their shoes fill up with water it's just um it grounds you I'm not trying to do some silly pun about shoes in the ground but it does ground you in a situation of like we've all well most of us have been in that you know at a funeral where it's raining and there's no you can't, you don't want to be anyone else. That makes it sound bad that you don't want to be at the funeral, but you can. So you're stood in that one spot with your shoes filling up with water because there's no other option but to be there. Um, because that's how we we mourn people. We can't just run away and hide from a bit of rain. Um, and I, 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 I think, you know, uh, I can, I've been at a funeral where it's been raining and you're there, you're in it. Um, and if you didn't bring an umbrella, that's that's your problem. Um, not really the takeaway of the, the lyric, to be fair, but you know what I mean. So I wrote down, I'm going to not fly through these, but I'm going to move through these a little bit quicker. I wanted to bring in some honourable mentions that didn't quite make the list. I hope I remember who these are from because I didn't write down uh, every artist. Um, uh, Radiohead's uh, Optimistic. You can try the best you can. You can try the best you can. The best you can is good enough. Uh, that's something uh, Tom York's partner at the time said to him when he was having writer's block. And like I said earlier, he was trying to write songs on his piano rather than his guitar because he was in the middle of a, uh, um, you know, a, a creative blank spot. Um, I Can Change by LCD Sound System. And love is a curse shoved in a hearse. Loved is an open book to a verse of your bad poetry. And this is coming from me. Now that's, a great line followed by a good bit of humor <laughs> that, you know, you calling someone else's poetry bad when his is, well, I suppose he believes that his isn't very good either. Um, but love is a curse shoved in a hearse. That's great. Um, and as he faced the sun, he cast no shadow, uh, Oasis cast no shadow, an observational lyric about the, um, the one of my favorites, the singer songwriter is Richard Ashcroft, but the idea yeah, as he faced the sun was he is he ever is he even there? Um uh your day breaks, your mind aches, you find that all your words of kindness linger on when she no longer needs you. That is by For No One by the Beatles. Um arguably one well, maybe not my I don't think it's the saddest song ever written, but there's something very it leaves me feeling uh enriched musically, but very empty and sad about someone, you know, being alone and singing for no one. But uh, all her words of kindness linger on when she no longer needs you. That's that's great. Um, this is a low, but if you but it won't hurt you when you're alone. It will be there with you. Um, yeah, like it's it's called uh, the song is this is a low by Blur. I've talked about it before, but I like that. You know. If if we're talking about depression or we're talking about, even if it's not, you know, something like a mental um, illness or a mental, you know, mental health issue, maybe it's just like, you know, you're feeling low, you've been broken up with and stuff. The idea of, of trying to tell yourself that it won't hurt you and that, you know, you'll get through it. And I know they're all kind of vague platitudes that you hear all the time on Instagram and stuff like, but sometimes those things work within yourself, you know, it depends on the person, of course, but to be able to say like, it's, this is something that is tough at the time, but it's not going to hurt you in any way. Um, uh, but, uh, but he follows it up with like, when you're alone, it'll be there with you. That kind of, it's, it's going to be there, but is it going to do you any damage? 
that's the question. I I have always liked that song. I've always thought um, Damon Albarn is a very underrated lyricist. Um, old man, look at my life. I'm a lot like you were. Uh, Neil Young's old man. Uh, a song he talks about. So he bought a ranch, and he, what came with a ranch is this this ranch hand who a farm hand ranch hand is that maybe not. Um, and he's an elderly man, so he wrote this song for him, and uh, you know a lot in the song he says, oh, "Old man, look at my life. I'm a lot, I'm a lot like you." Um, and how we we're we're both human, and we both need the same kind of human connections and stuff like that. Um, Peter Gabriel, I've talked about this song with uh, Joanne on episode two hundred. Um, but the line, I'm digging in the dirt, stay with me, I need support. Um, you're going deep into yourself when it comes to something like therapy and it's it's not always easy. Um, uh, but, and you will need that support, you know. Uh, and sometimes it's not easy. I think that's, a, that's another thing which I kind of didn't, I don't think I mentioned at the time. Sometimes it's not easy to tell someone you're going to therapy or that you need therapy because I don't, no, not everybody understands the reason for it. And maybe they think that they're impervious to uh, mental health, health or being as down as you could be to need that kind of thing, to need that help. And it's and it's sometimes it's hard to tell that person. Um, so I could kind of understand that. But if you have that person in your life that just says, well, that's if that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. And I'm here for you whenever you need me. Um, they're the people you need in your life and they're the ones you need to, to hang on to. Um, imagine the future, woke up with a scream, I was buying some feelings from a vending machine. Now that, that is good. Now that's Richard Ashcroft right there. Um, yeah, I like when I bought uh, An Order and Soul for the first time, it was uh, it was the Verve's second album before their biggest album, Urban Hymns. They had An Order and Soul, which is, oh, oh, it's such a good, um, it's such a good album. Um, that's from a song called Life's an Ocean by the way but on the back of it there's got like the bass player Simon Jones is literally he's at a vending machine it just has feelings on it and he's putting some money in but I love that line I think it's I think it's very clever it's almost something you'd write and scribble out and say no nah, that's a you know do I want to have the word vending machine in a song but um, Rich Ashcroft said I do and it's it's very important Um. Numb by you two. People don't like Numb. I think Numb is so good. It's the one where Edge raps on, basically. Uh, but the line is, too much is not enough, yeah. Now, a reason I put that in is because at the time, you two seemed to be going for, like, excess, you know, the, the, the Zoo TV tour and Zoo Europa and everything sounded so different to what you, we believe you two should sound like. If, you know. And the excess within that line, too much is not enough, is uh, is perfect for that phase of you two, even if that's not exactly how he meant it or or he wrote it. Um, take my shoes off and throw them in the lake, and I'll be two steps on the water. That's our our friend of the show. I know. Um, Kate Bush, uh, with uh, yeah, I think like, and I'll be um. Uh, that's called, sorry, the song is called Hounds of Love. I couldn't think of what the song was called. Uh, Hounds of Love, but take my shoes off, throw them in the lake and I'll be two steps on the water. I love the fact that she writes in in some sort of vagueness all the time and in this dream world. And it reminds me, and maybe I heard it before, that it's got something to do with the red shoes, the the the, the ballet film with Norma Shearer. And I, it's a great film, by the way, if you haven't seen it. But that idea of these magical shoes and it's a Hans Christian Andersen story it's based on. And I, I wonder if that got anything to do with it. Because Kate Bush definitely watched that film. She lived that film for about 10 years, I'd say. Um, I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. Johnny Cash, Folsom Prison Blues. I shot a man just to watch him die. That's a that's such a cool line. I mean, it's very violent and unnecessary. And I don't think I don't think it'd be an entertaining thing to watch someone die. But um, just the brutality of it in that in in that way, and I watched an old clip of Waylon Jennings and Je and Johnny Cash on Letterman there a while ago on YouTube, and there's and and I remember Letterman saying these these lads are so they're larger than life. He said he was walking on the hall of the studios and the two lads were coming towards him and he thought something was going to kick off. That's an immediate reaction, like an old like a couple of old gunslingers or something. Um, Okay, so abandon too soon, sit down with due care, don't walk away in silence. So that's by Joy Division. 
Uh, Ian Curtis um, passed away when he was 21 or 2. Um, severely depressed. Took his own life, unfortunately. Um, I think I this sticks with me more because of the, you know, abandoned too soon. Okay, I'm going to read it again. Abandoned too soon. Sat down with due care. Don't walk away in silence. Um, it was almost like this, or I think this actually came out after he passed away, and it was almost like he was writing for that moment, which is um, if that's if that's what it was. Now it's easy to say that now we, you know, in hindsight, but if that's what it was, it makes it even more devastating. The fact that like, don't walk away in silence is in there, but it's um, it's it's a beautiful song. Up, down, turn around. Please don't let me hit the ground tonight. I think I'll walk. Why did I write that time? Tonight I think I'll walk alone and find my soul as I go home. That's Temptation by New Order following on from uh, Joy Division. Um, I, I, do, I love that song. I don't know if the lyrics are particularly, uh, if, or if I can c- kind of understand what he means. But I do like the idea of I'll walk alone, I'll walk home alone and I'll find my soul as I go home. I think, you know, are we being, is this another song about, you know, being in a nightclub and not finding a partner? Because I can definitely relate to that stuff. Um, brand new. Da- OK, here's one from Joan Armitrading. Uh, it's called it's a bit longer. It's from Down to Zero. It's um, another must listen. Brand new dandy. First class scene stealer walks through the crowd and takes your man, sends you rushing to the mirror, brush your eyebrows and say there's more beauty in you than anyone. Is that the greatest thing I've ever read on this podcast? I bet so, I'm going to read it again. Now, just take this in, right? Take just imagine this is a scene. This is you in a nightclub, okay, or a pub, whatever. Brand new dandy, first class scene stealer walks through the crowd and takes your man, sends you rushing to the mirror, brush your eyebrows, and say, "There's more beauty in you than anyone." Yeah, that's the best thing I've ever read in the podcast, actually. Um. Actually, maybe uh, to to go back to the very beginning to Claire uh, and say that might be my favorite lyric of all time. Um, it encapsulates everything that's happened in my life. <laughs> no, that's a joke, obviously. But the you know that that whole thing of of are we good enough? Are we attractive enough? Um, is someone always around the corner going to take our man or our woman? Um, and do we or can we go to the mirror afterwards? Do we have the, the inner strength to say there's more beauty in you than anyone? Because at the time it is it is a very hard slap in the face when someone just goes off. Um, but so maybe uh, maybe Claire, that's my favorite song. Uh, sorry, my favorite lyric of all time. Um, I appreciate everyone listening today to hear me talk and talk and talk. Um, and I also want to say, Joanne, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you very much for the notebook. It is now in use. Uh, I have amongst the scream on the front of it. Thank you very much to John for his. Um, I'd love to hear John's favorite lyrics. I think they're probably all Creedence Clearwater Revival lyrics, but uh, that's cool. That's okay too. Um, thanks for uh, your technical support. Thanks to my mom, my dad, my granddad, Jer and Calvin. Uh, Jer and Calvin. Well, actually, my mum and dad, my grandma, Jer and Calvin, will get give great answers about their favorite lyrics. Um, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube if you would. It's um, it's building over there, and uh, you know that's important. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, X. X is, and I know I've been saying this for a while. X is very thin ice. It's that because I worry, I really don't use it, and I don't to contact people on it. You know, I don't. I I've no banter or crack with people on it. Um, so I may just get rid of that and just stay with Facebook and Instagram. Um, you can listen to us on Spotify, on the go, Apple, Anchor, Google Podcasts, etc. Um, so have a think about your own favorite lyrics. And look, if you if you want look if you want a bit of back and forth and a bit of conversation, send us your favorite lyric on Facebook or Instagram. DM us. I read them eventually. You know, sometimes they're hidden. It's hard to find them. Um, but yeah, send them on. Um. And if you're not into lyrics, fair enough, fair play. I don't know. I don't mind. Um, but yeah, once again, thanks you very much for your support and for watching and for listening to this. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, there might be a guest next week. You never know. I can't make any promises. All right, everyone. Uh, take care and have a good week. <laughs>